Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everybody. You are in, in right place, and it's uh, exactly four o'clock. So I will be speaking maybe a few seconds just to allow people to, to enter the Microsoft Teams uh, room. I can see that we are almost over 100 uh, uh, participants. So maybe I will wait until uh, we, we get that number. I hope you are well and safe, uh, given the very difficult times we are all living in. And I am super, super happy of uh, having organized this uh, international webinar with uh, such a fantastic panelist. And also, uh, you know, with all of you, we have people from uh, uh, South Africa. I can see uh, my friend Dirk. We have people from San Francisco. Well, people from South America, of course, people from uh, London, from Bristol, from UK, from Italy, Milan, Bergamo, throughout all Europe, and again, also people from China. This is a, a very international crowd, so uh, I can feel the empathy and the energy of people who are really passionate and uh, attached to their places and to try to build a, a local community of solidarity and of recovery after post after COVID-19. Okay, so I think now it's uh, probably um, the time to officially kick off uh, this uh, international webinar on cities and communities beyond COVID-19. So welcome uh, uh, everybody. My name is uh, uh, Alessandro Sancino and I will be the moderator of this uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, some housekeeping uh, uh, rules. So I kindly ask you please uh, to mute yourself and uh, if you can uh, to take your video camera off, but if you prefer to keep the camera on, please uh, do that. Uh, I'm also mentioning that the session is being recorded and will be available uh, to view on YouTube. So I hope that's okay with you. If that's not okay with you, maybe uh, try to turn your camera off and to, to not speak. In that case, you will not appear. And uh, uh, let me say a few words about the format uh, of the webinar and then uh, a few words about uh, our incredible panel. So uh, we will have uh, um, a roundtable format, basically. So the first speaker will be Professor Robin Hambleton, who has just written a book on cities and communities beyond COVID-19. Then we will have uh, uh, three questions for our uh, uh, political and civil society leaders from Bergamo, Bristol, London, and Milan in alphabetical order. But uh, uh, most importantly, we will have quite uh, a few time for your questions. So please uh, do ask your questions on the chat box that will be managed by Michelle and Joanna and Keith. So thank you for, for your support, of course. And then we will have a final close off in, in, in 10 minutes. And I promise you 5.30 p.m. UK time, uh, it, the webinar will finish. But uh, again, a uh, few words to introduce our, our speakers. So uh, we have, uh, I'm going to introduce before uh, Georgia and, and Escher. So Georgia is a, a fantastic local leader, leader of Camden. We, we all love Camden. And so it's a fantastic place. She's also uh, chair of the whole uh, London Council. So we are honored to, to have you here and also councillor for Kentish Town uh, Ward. So welcome, Georgia, and thank you. It's a big privilege. We have uh, Escher. Escher is the deputy mayor in Bristol with responsibilities for uh, communities, um, public health, and uh, equalities. So again, uh, welcome, welcome. A big hug from, from, from here. And then we have uh, Bruno Ceccarelli, city councillor uh, in Milan. And I know uh, Bruno since uh, probably seven years. I was a city councillor myself uh, in, in Milan. And I have to say that uh, among 45 people, Bruno was the best, really. So it's my privilege having Bruno here. Giuseppe, Giuseppe is the president Giuseppe, of uh, the cooperatives uh, in, in Bergamo. Uh, in Italy, the cooperative sector is probably 
um, the, Italy is one of the most important countries in terms of importance of the cooperative sector. And you know, Bergamo was the hardest hit city in Italy and probably in Europe by the first wave of COVID-19. Uh, you, you will uh, all remember maybe the sad images of, uh, you know, uh, motor cars uh, full of uh, dead bodies uh, were driven by, by the army out of Bergamo. So thank you, Giuseppe. It's a big privilege. And then we have uh, Robin. Robin uh, is a, a great source of inspiration for all of us. He's a meritus professor of city leadership at the uh, University of West England in Bristol. And uh, he's uh, somebody who uh, has always spoken about the importance of local leadership uh, since a lot of time. So thank you, Robin, for, for being a, a source of inspiration and for uh, you know, speaking about those topics uh, as a pioneer. So uh, I don't want to take uh, uh, further time, so I will start with uh, um, one question from, from Robin. We, we start from you. So in your book, uh, you, you say that uh, COVID-19 mean that uh, there needs to be fundamental change. So let me ask you why, if you can uh, uh, share with us, why do you believe that? Please, thank you. Okay, well, first of all, Alessandro, I want to say thank you to you and your colleagues at the Open University for putting this international webinar together. Uh, it's fantastic, thank you for doing that and thank you to the four wonderful speakers we've got today. So I'm really looking forward to a, a good exchange. Um, I think uh, in, in responding to your question, I think I'd like to make three points, three fairly concise points. One is about the disaster of COVID-19. I think we do have to face that. Secondly, to talk about power relations in our modern societies. And thirdly, I'm going to suggest to, the, uh, to everyone here that the central challenge we face is to improve governance, and in particular, place-based governance. So uh, just to come first then to this disaster that we face, um, Colleagues in the UK will, will know that yesterday was the anniversary of our first lockdown. So yesterday there were tributes and vigils around the country to remember the people who've died. I've got the newspaper here. This is a, a national newspaper and you can see pictures of people putting lights outside their homes to recognise what's happened. Um, really very upsetting. If I could add to that just a few figures, nobody wants a lot of figures, but I think it's important for us here in Britain and in Italy to note the costs of the pandemic. Just ever so briefly, in the world, we had 124 million cases. 2.7 million people have died, but 352 people per million. The UK and Italy have suffered particularly badly. So in the UK, we have 4.3 million cases, 126,000 people have died in the UK, and that's 1,853 per million. That's a very high rate. It's a very high death rate. Sadly, Italy is, uh, is, a, is not a lot, uh, a lot better. It's 3.4 million cases, 105,000 deaths, and 1,753 uh, 1, per million. So I, I just wanted to make that point at the beginning, Alessandro, before we start to look at solutions and how to address these challenges. It is quite a deep shock. And the other thing to say about the evidence, and it's come out since I wrote my book even more clearly, um, the pandemics reveal shocking inequalities in our societies. And I'm sure all our panelists will want to respond to that. But the central message of my book is um, not just to recognize the disaster we face, but to look at the possibilities. And I think it's true that in communities across the world, we've seen an upsurge in community caring, I call it, and community spirit, which perhaps gives us some hope. So that's my first point. Second point then is about power relations. And it's developed in the book, but I'll keep it simple. I want to suggest that we do have to look more critically at power relations in our societies. And I'm suggesting there are two kinds of power. This is a bit of a simplification, but if you'd bear with it, I'm suggesting 
there is placeless power in the modern world and based power. So what do I mean by these two words? Placeless power holders make decisions about places and are unconcerned with the impact they are having on those places. So if you think about globalization in the last 40 years or so, it's expanded the power of multinational companies that move investments around the world to seek profit. They are not concerned really uh, about the impacts on the whole of those decisions on places. And that's why we've got a pandemic. If you look at the causes of why we've got a pandemic, it is about ruthless exploitation of the planet and people on the planet in a way that's not sensible. So what's this other source of power? It's place-based. And here we've got some speakers who will come at this with their real practical experience in a few moments. We've got this uh, great knowledge in localities of the nature of the challenges communities face, which do vary a great deal. And it's possible, and we happening, we've got magnificent responses at the local level to the challenges we face. So I'm suggesting that caring is the key value that we should be guided by now. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you, Alessandro. So, I think the challenge that we now face is not just a public health or an economic challenge. I'm, I'm looking now at this challenge of governance. I think sort of cities and societies, localities, face four challenges at once. One, the, pub, the public health pandemic challenge. Two, the economic downturn arising from the pandemic. Three, the dramatic growth of inequality in our societies, including racial inequality. And then, uh, fourthly, of course, the long-standing climate change emergency. So I think effective responses to COVID-19 need to take on those four challenges at once. It is a little bit intimidating, but I do think cities and uh, there's examples in the book across the world are doing exactly that. In the book, I developed some ideas about place-based leadership that perhaps can help at a conceptual level, think about how to do this. Um, and there's a lot of wonderful interaction taking place between localities and cities. But I'd just make one uh, perhaps last point before we open up. I'm suggesting there are five realms of leadership in any place. Political leaders elected to serve the population at the ballot box. Secondly, public servants appointed by the state and public agencies to provide and develop public services. Thirdly, the business community. Fourthly, trade unions. And fifthly, community leaders outside the state. I skipped through that very quickly, but there are these realms in most places, in my experience. And it's where you get the overlaps between the realms that you can get really creative things happening. So, Sandra, I've skipped through quite a few points fairly quickly there, but I think I wanted just to set the scene in that way and then hand it over back to you to move it on to our local leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robin, for um, such a su thoughtful overview. So let me ask uh, now to our uh, four local leaders the first question. So if you can share with us uh, what uh, you have learned from managing the COVID-19 emergency. And if you can please uh, share one story, one experience that you um, you have that has challenged you in, in your city. So if you don't mind, uh, let me start probably with, with Bergamo and with Giuseppe, because again, uh, it's probably the hardest hit uh, city in Europe. So Giuseppe, uh, well, over you. to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, an honor for, for me to, to take a floor here. And thank you very much to invite me for uh, this um, webinar. Uh, but it's a very uh, good uh, question. I, I think the explosion of pandemic in Bergamo found us totally unprepared, uh, which brought uh, down the illusion that whole health system in Lombardy 
which uh, in the last uh, 20 years has been strongly focused on centralized on technologically advanced hospital could protect us from any event. The pandemic, on the other hand, proved that whole healthcare system was indeed a giant with feet of clay. Prevention, basic medicine, local health network have been neglected for more than 20 years. This has prompted both public and private health system operators, operators uh, to focus their investment in hospital services with high technological intensity, but let me say with a low content of social care. The culture of assistance and care transformed into a culture of performance focused on budget. Consequently, home care work, relational assistance services, prevention and education activity are carried out mainly by the civil society organization, social cooperatives, community foundation, association. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, in the first wave in Bergamo, a huge response was organized in that few days with a mobilization of whole local institution and whole member of civil society. Thanks uh, to the extraordinary export of uh, our mayor, Giorgio Gori, but also with engagement of our social cooperative, for example. We had made a network of uh, 500 volunteers has been organized who have taken steps to ensure proximity care of uh, our people, also for aging people. And uh, there are two experiences that I can describe as emblematic in this contest. Uh, the first one is the hospital build of the Bergamo Fair. And the, the second is the two COVID hotels set up by social cooperative. Uh, both Fair Hospital and the COVID Hotel have been funded with the impressive fundraising capacity and the large amount of donation that have been made from enterprises, from people, from local uh, journal to, to, to promote to local press. Uh, we had very, very, very uh, big donation. And the hospital built in the Bergamo Fair uh, by the Alpini Association. Alpini is an organization of former soldier that uh, made uh, uh, civil protection, uh, volunteer for many, many questions. And also the people from Craftsman Association, is Artigiani in, in Italian, is, uh, was built in two weeks uh, with the participation of 250 people who worked voluntarily for free for 16,000 hours. Here in this hospital, NGO emergency provide medical services for the people. And this is a very interesting mobilization for civil society. In the second experience, the COVID hotel set up by social cooperative uh, was uh, been the most intensive experience uh, which I am direct involved in the organization on uh, operational management between a group of seven social cooperatives with the two manager of the, uh, the hotel and the local authority. We're making this COVID hotel transformed into reception and care facility for patients who had to be discharged from hospital uh, to free up a bed. Because in this week, uh, the last year, hospital in Bergamo are very, very uh, uh, exploded by a, a, a lot of people. And we need to, to free up a bed. And we had uh, uh, made it this uh, COVID hotel. Our social cooperative designed the first COVID hotel in Europe, defining rule, procedure, and the safety device to manage care performance in a non-medical place. It's a very uh, strong experience. 
and from March to May 2020, our hotel took care of more 500 people. And so we are free up bed in the hospital, a care to these people. It's a very big experience for us, this one. Uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry for my bad English, but I hope you are understand. Yeah, no, 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 it's perfect. Thank you, Giuseppe. So the, the, the key role of civil society for, for coping with the pandemic uh, alongside public administration and all the limits of uh, performance culture within uh, health systems. Now let's turn over to Escher or, or, or Georgia. Who would you like to go first? I'll, I'm happy to go next. Hi. Yeah, hi, uh, Escher. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Alessandro, and uh, thank you for inviting me today. So we know that the CIS up uh, the city's efforts supporting uh, the economically vulnerable during lockdown has been phenomenal. We know that injustice doesn't affect everyone equally. And while we're all at risk of COVID, uh, there are some people, as we know, that are far more vulnerable. And, and, and the existing inequalities uh, that existed within the city just created the perfect storm uh, for COVID-19. Black, Asian and minority ethnic residents uh, were more likely to live in overcrowded housing, more likely to be exposed to the virus, more likely to die from it, and are most vulnerable to the economic shocks that have been brought about by uh, the closure of different sectors across the economy. Unemployment in the city has increased most in areas of high deprivation, uh, uh, which had one of the higher levels of unemployment even before the pandemic. And digital inclusion amongst young people, older people and migrant communities was another major issue that we had to tackle. But the power of the voluntary and the community sector um, has been amazing. So we have something called Can Do Bristol. It was a, an online volunteering website. And before the pandemic, it was just bumbling along. You know, you might have had two, three hundred people who had signed up to the volunteering website. Um, as soon as we went into lockdown, um, we uh, we advertised the fact that we uh, we had the the the, um, the website, and as a result, within I think it was like 72 hours, we went from a few hundred to nearly 4,000 people across the city signing up to be volunteers, okay? And in, and in total so far, we allocated about 8,223 volunteer activities. We took over 10,000 calls through our Bristol advice line. We stood up a infrastructure to support every part of the city. We also stood up 23 community hubs which were wrapped around the many mutual aid support groups. So as you know, lots of different people were neighbors, were just springing up all over the place. And it was really important for us to provide some kind of infrastructure, allow those community, those mutual aid groups to still be flexible and do what they wanted to do. But we also had to make sure that we were protecting the most vulnerable and safeguarding efforts. So in developing the community hub and spoke approach, those mutual aid support groups um, could connect into kind of key hubs in their, their local communities and help to support many of the vulnerable people who were shielding, shopping, prescriptions, dog walking. Um, we even had volunteers phoning people who were isolated on a weekly basis just to keep people's spirits up. I mean, like I said, everywhere saw an explosion of mutual aid support groups and volunteers. And we, the city added, we just added another layer of support and resources, uh, including around food and, and ensuring that nutritious food was also being delivered and cooked meals were being delivered uh, where possible. Our, our, Bristol, our food sector pivoted very quickly to lend their support by providing meals to the homeless and to our NHS care staff. We had restaurants empty their larders and fridges, and I mean even up to you know four or five star <laughs> restaurants. I mean some of our homeless people were getting some really great meals. I can I can assure you, but they just emptied everything and cooked up meals and distributed 
across um, our, uh, our hotels uh, where many of our homeless community have been um, housed. We've also, um, on, in addition to that, we stood up a um, online resources. We made sure that we had a lot of online resources available, uh, particularly around food. We ensured that we were also in, uh, making sure that culturally appropriate food was being delivered to many of our different um, diverse communities across the city. So the infrastructure made sure that we involved uh, refugee women of Bristol, our 91 Ways, a whole range of volunteers, chefs and community workers just um, you know, from around the city. It, it was real, a real phenomenal effort just to kind of give you an example, the first 10 weeks of lockdown, we distributed 120 tons of food through that network, including emergency food projects. Through the 26 uh, community hubs, we, um, we produced 221,000 meals and 16,200 food parcels were distributed throughout the city with nearly half of that food support going to children. So this Herculean effort and this task uh, could not have been um, successful if we did not have the one city uh, infrastructure that we have. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that um, uh, uh, going forward. But, you know, tackling food insecurity, food poverty is now embedded across our one city plan and all of our key infrastructure uh, city boards and organizations. I was at a meeting yesterday where somebody told me that food is, um, the theme of food is, appears in every single one of our key policy, city policy documents. I think about 90 odd times, whether it's climate emergency, whether it's our transport, whether it's our parks and green spaces. I mean, we are now as a result of um, what's been happening in the city and making sure that the lessons that we are learning are not going to be lost and are very much embedded in the way we, as a city, are going to build back better and recover. So um, that's there's my example. Thank you. Thank you, Asher. Wonderful examples and a lot to, to think about. Let's now move to, to Georgia and, and then to, to, to Bruno. So, Georgia, the same question uh, over to you, please. Thank you so much um, for having me in, in this conversation. And I think that the first thing I think I've learned has been exemplified by the, the speakers so far, which is the, the the power of local places to respond to their communities. And I think that in, in the UK, we saw the national response um, flounder time and time again. So there was a national food distribution program that we, we never really saw in our communities and wasn't sensitive uh, to their needs. But every single uh, local council in, in London and uh, and Asha has just said how powerful in Bristol responded with a network of community provision where local um, voluntary sector, community organisations, even businesses came together to ensure that people didn't go hungry. And it was at a local place that we were able to draw on those relationships and that that kind of depth of understanding to, to provide for for our community. So. So the national system ended up wasting a lot of money on centralised solutions that didn't respond to needs and test and trace, um, which uh, for, for those uh, outside of the UK was was uh, a, a, a national, the, the government tried to set up a new national system to, to trace the virus. And it, it has never really worked. And what we've ended up kind of now a year in is a lot of that resource is now going down to, to local authorities. And that works much better because our housing staff, our community staff know know their communities, have have real relationships, and are able to to work with them in a completely different way. So I think that um, uh, that I well I hope that what comes out of the pandemic is a real understanding of the importance of of local services, which are built on strong relationships with place and are able to 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 move quickly to respond to need. I think the second thing again builds on on what has been been said already is is the extent of the inequalities ex exposed by by COVID and I think Asha talked about some of this the the impact we saw um, of job insecurity of of overcrowding things that were deeply um, embedded before the crisis 
but um, became an, a risk to life for, during the crisis. So we so we still see that um, many of our residents will not come forward for a COVID test because they are afraid that if they do, um, they 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 might have to self isolate for two weeks and they will lose their job because their work is so insecure and that they they have um, uh, so little to to fall back on. So we found that that the welfare state that we thought was there to support people hasn't hasn't been able to hold people and we've almost ended up in local places with a kind of shadow welfare state in the UK where councils are trying to respond with little bits of funding they have, uh, food support, um, uh, 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 support around rent and, and financial insecurity to um, to respond to almost overwhelming needs but the, the national system it isn't really able to, to hold and support people. Um, but I suppose on a more positive note, I think we've we've also seen the way that um, that in a crisis sometimes barriers are reduced. So whether that's data, I know it's very boring to talk about data, but I think one of the big challenges we've seen, certainly around vaccination, for example, is is problems around data sharing, which means we're not able to to, to reach people in the way uh, we we might want to, and we've had we've been able to 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 quite quickly create new uh, mechanisms to share data with with our voluntary sector and across local councils and the NHS. And, and we've seen services come together in new ways. So uh, uh, around rough sleeping, the, you know, the, the, the serv- we were very concerned about people who were living on the streets um, already with deep health inequalities. Um, and the government kind of set a challenge that we would uh, uh, support everyone um, to to come into to some kind of provision, um, and for the first time, really made funding available. And in Camden, we we took over a hotel to 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 support people, um, but because we had to do it very quickly, we had all of our services in one place. So we had a kind of a, a nurse um, dealing with some of uh, the health needs. We had mental health provision. We had substance misuse provision, all, all in this hotel. And actually. What ended up happening is we were dealing with long term health inequalities, people who'd never gone to a GP before, who'd never accessed support, um, suddenly found themselves in a, in a pathway to long term secure housing. And despite all of our efforts previously to join up services, we never really managed it. So kind of going forward, we're now working together with with the NHS to 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 plan a long term service. And I, I, I won't go on, but there's so many different examples of, of where we've come together across different services and and created something um more powerful but i think i I just finish with just the 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 importance of listening to communities and and those relationships and one of our big worries in camden was we was we weren't we didn't have visibility over children who weren't coming to school and uh you know we were really struggling to to reach children and and what some of our early health workers who are kind of uh uh, there to, to to support families uh, when they're just starting to 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 develop issues and challenges. Uh, persuaded one of the local businesses to give them a, um, a, a kind of van full of Easter eggs, and the team just went door to door handing out Easter eggs. And that and that was the thing that that had parents opening the door, having a chat because it was a gift. It didn't come with an agenda, just to have a chat and talk about some of the challenges they might be facing. And and then they were able to, to access support. And I think those frontline workers being being able to to build relationships with 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 people is is the 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 kind of most important building block for for responding to communities and we need to give more power to to local places and and um people on the front line thank you george such an insightful uh, um, you know comments uh, uh, from from the welfare state again to the power of place and to the role of co-production some great questions in the chat from john diamond a great editor of a very important PA, Public Administration Journal, Fulvio, we will deal with, with the questions. So now uh, over, over to Bruno, so uh, f- from Milan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Proud to be here. Thanks, uh, Alessandro. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, uh, Giuseppe already said that in Italy we faced one of the first and, and worst stroke from the pandemic, from the virus. And uh, in, in late February, our anniversary is... Uh, one month uh, ago was one, one month ago, so it's it's one of the first, and uh, we weren't prepared. Uh, we we came uh, at it uh, with without uh, uh, a defense, and uh, we came to a full stop uh, just a few days after the the first stroke, and uh, 
um, from our side, from the side of a, a public, uh, a civil servant, we we have to to deal with a with a, a new challenge, because uh, there's the emergency. Uh, it's uh, it is the same also if happening uh, one or or a little late. That's the the emergency. You have to deal with a tactical approach. You have to try to solve, uh, try to to solve the 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 short term uh, in a short term ver version and vision. And, but you have also to try to maintain a a balance for a, a long term view, for a strategic view, because all you have to 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 decide all your decision has an impact not only in, in the in the short term but also in the in the long term, it try and trying to to maintain this balance is the real struggle. It, it's the real struggle also now, that uh, one year later from from that. Uh, of course, what what uh, we we saw what already has been uh, described very very good. It happened also in Milan. We we have a tradition. We run directly our kitchen for the the children in the school. We have uh, uh, more than fifty thousand meals every day. Deliver it uh, to the school, to the little ones, to the the children, and for many of them, this is the only real meal in the day. So if you stop everything, and if you just uh, um, tell them to to go home and remain home, you are not sure that uh, the nutrition is made in their home. So we converted our kitchen in order to deliver to the poor to the poorest part of the city using our worker and and also, also you we had to deal uh, with the mutual to the spontaneous uh, response uh, a very uh, empowering response and try to uh, coordinate in order to to be as uh, as near to the need as you you can be uh, the, the struggle was also for the, the education system. If you stopped school, you have to deal with uh, uh, remote uh, distance learning. Uh, so we collected thousands of the notebook and uh, pad from uh, Greek corporation and delivered that home for, for the people and the children in need. Uh, this is, of course, uh, really, really something that uh, can be seen as a, as a tactical approach. On the strategic side, we completed the um, connection for the whole um, schools in, in Milan with uh, optical fiber. Uh, also for the future, because uh, you don't know what, uh, what the future is, uh, is coming. Uh, Milan is now a, a city really different from the past. You can see many bikes uh, along the, the city. It's very strange in, in a city like, uh, in a city full of cars like Milan, we have the one of the highest ratio for number of cars for habitants. Uh, also because we painted new lane at the side of the of the current street, bending the rules, bending the rules in order to 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 try to do something different. And also we gave a, a temporary permit for bar and restaurant in, in order to place table outside. Uh, and now Milan is, is something more similar to the Ramblas of Barcelona, I think, uh, for, for this, uh, this change. But you, you had to maintain the distance and try to, to make something for also the, the private sector. Now I think that what have we learned is, is the question. Well, we, we learned that uh, what was seen impossible happened. Now we have to think about the future and think about something also that now can can be seen as impossible if we think about the future, and this is a really really important challenge that uh, we already have. But just one thing, um, fr from mm, I'm in charge of the of the commission that is uh, uh, deal with the planning and development. Uh, so we we deal with architects uh, thinking about architecture and the future. And of course, the, the worker from, from our side was in, uh, in remote working. Uh, in, in Italy, we, we call it smart working, but I, I know it's, it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's bad English, but let, let me say. Um, our worker from, from, the, from the Milan uh, uh, workforce uh, dealt with the architects online. And this was 
really uh, helpful and, uh, and more efficient than the, in the past. Architects were, uh, were supposed to go to, to our buildings with uh, a huge amount of, uh, of plants, uh, paper and so on, while now they can deal for asking permits and um, and try to to solve their uh, their problems mm, using teams uh, they can share the screen use the the software this is something that we we can take from the pandemic and try to to put for for the future of course and the 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 the, the things about the uh, explosion of the inequalities are of course our our main struggle that's the the core point and that's that's what we have to do now, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno, for, for your great points. Uh, let me now go to the second uh, uh, question that I'm going to run through our four uh, local leaders. But in the meantime, again, let me say thank you to all those who have written questions. Uh, John Wolf, Associate Dean at the Open University, Professor Richard Callan in San Francisco. So I'm going now to uh, ask uh, this question and also to report some of the points uh, raised in the chat box. So the question is, what do you think cities and communities will be like after COVID-19? And in answering the question, please bear in mind some points which have been raised in the chat box about uh, what uh, we have learned from a public administration and governance perspective. Are we now better prepared to cope with emergency? was asking uh, Alberto, and how is this helpful, this concept of smart city, uh, to, to, to be better prepared? Uh, it will be better for post-COVID-19 cities. And also something about uh, the role of religious groups, uh, which is also related to civil society and the publics uh, of COVID. And there was also one question in the meantime about food policy. So we are seeing uh, from Milan uh, the, the queue of people uh, uh, for, for getting a food parcel increasing and increasing. So again, which cities are, are waiting for us in a post-COVID-19 uh, near future? So let's now start off from, um, from Georgia, if you don't mind, and then we go back maybe to Giuseppe. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I think that so much depends on our own actions and policies, because I think there's a scenario where cities become even more unequal. We've seen, you know, we're seeing a, an economic crisis and a poverty crisis, which will be as bad um, and impact as many people, I think, as, as the public health crisis. And you, uh, many jobs um, will will take a long time to, to come back. We're, we're seeing kind of doubling of, of unemployment rates. And you, you can see a scenario where we, um, where some industries bounce back by quick, quite quickly. For some people, you know, they've built up a lot of disposable income during the pandemic. Um, they, they could move to a kind of more hybrid way of working and, and life could go back to, to normal quite quickly. And then we have the people that we've been discussing uh, during this, this conversation. And if we don't have kind of quite major public policy interventions, there is a scenario where those inequalities become deeper um, and, uh, and cities become even more divided. So I think that we have a real responsibility to try and like take this the, the big public conversation we've had about about inequality in all of its forms um, and and lead that to, to real change because I think that having seen what we've seen um, and particularly some of the race inequality um, that we've seen in the way that this pandemic has has disproportionately impacted different communities I think if we don't address that head on and create change the level of distrust. Um, and anger um, would, will be justifiably very high. And I think we, um, so, so what does that mean? I think if we're, it's that kind of question that everyone wants to say at the moment, how, how, do, we, how do we build back better? I think, um, you know, bearing in mind that we also have the climate crisis uh, upon us and the, the pandemic has shown, I think, the importance of green spaces, of uh, kind of shopping um, networks close to home and that people have really appreciated that. They, they've appreciated um, uh, the, 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 their kind of local place. And, and so you could imagine a scenario where we invest more in, in uh, uh, 15 minute cities and in creating kind of culture and uh, thriving high streets close to people's home. We, we, we uh, invest in, in new green jobs. There's a massive challenge around, um, uh, around in, 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 uh, certainly in the UK, 
around uh, the sustainability of our buildings. In Camden, we've done a, a study on what it would take for our, all of the buildings that the council owns, which is about a third of, of my uh, borough to neutral, and it's it's uh, around 500 million, so a massive um, investment, and that's about 33,000 homes, to just give you a sense. So, But if we did kind of put significant investment into new green jobs, then we you know, we, we can deal with some of the unemployment crisis um, and move uh, towards these big ambitions we've made about around zero carbon. Um, and uh, if we if we think about what has become a kind of basic need as a result of the last year, digital access, I think Bruno talked about the importance of digital access. It, it became impossible to access education and services without digital access. And yet, in, at the start of the pandemic, we, in some of our schools, 60% of children didn't have access to a device at home, or it was very patchy. Their parents could only sometimes afford internet access. What, you know, what would it do if that was a right for everyone, if access to green space um, and good quality green space was a right for everyone, of, of housing that, um, uh, that meant everybody had enough space, um, uh, rather than the kind of levels of, of overcrowding we've seen, and we've just talked about uh, access to, to healthy food. So, I, I, and I think that the, the decisions to what cities are like, uh, some of them sit in the hands of local leaders, and I think there's a huge amount we can do to build new coalitions um, and to, to kind of kickstart some of that investment. But I think some of it will require kind of national decision makers to invest in, in a different role for cities. Um, and the final thing I, I'll say is that I, I think there's there's sometimes an argument that the city is kind of over, that, you know, people are wanting to go out into to, um, uh, the countryside. And, and I still think that, that cities are the, the most sustainable way of living, that cities can be places where people thrive um, and that there is, you know, that, that kind of desire that we see so deeply for connection and collaboration can have a kind of powerful new place in the city of, of the future. But unless we deal with the depth of inequality, I think that cities will become increasingly divided um, and kind of desperate places, really. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, thank you very much, Giuseppe. Oh, thank you, thank you. Also, this uh, question is very important. I uh, try to, to to answer, but also taking charge of the, the very interesting uh, question uh, issue from the the, the chat. And uh, the first, I believe that the pandemic have made it clear how important it is for uh, the city to have a social dimension a neighborhood uh, lifestyle that keep people together and uh, active. Uh, we need to choose innovative form of living and moving of this, the, 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 the people in the, the, to, to extend the service that can be reached in the 15 minutes of walking, for example. City must return to being more uh, suited to the people than the cars, for example, in my town is very evident that it's a very little town, but uh, there is a, a lot of car, uh, there is not space for people to socialize, to relationship, and we must uh, uh, also rethink uh, the organization of our own, for example, by providing a way to living that is modifiable according to the different phase of the life, and that is designed, for example, to manage the care at home of non-self-sufficient people. Uh, I think we had learned that uh, we, we <coughs> new uh, digital technology, for example, is very important. Uh, with, uh, work can be radically changed work but also the, the the school is very radical change but we cannot uh, think uh, uh, the, the new possibility if we don't think at the space in the home but also in the town in the neighborhood many uh, children uh, don't have a space uh, adequate to, to participate at the school at distance on the remote and so, for example, we had uh, prepared a project in uh, in Bergamo uh, and also in the province, in the, 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 the region of Bergamo, uh, to um, make a digital divide with uh, young 
people. It's very interesting. This uh, project is uh, financing with uh, a, a big foundation. It's uh, called the Cariplo Foundation. It's very interesting to um, uh, remove the, the, the poverty in education, for example. And for this reason, I insist a lot on the role of collective and cooperative form of work as response to the new anonymity uh, or uh, uh, the people uh, suffer uh, for this alone in the digital work or in the digital school. And so we need to create a, a new form of, of, of city. Uh, family are fragile. Many people live alone. In Bergamo, most of the people live alone or with a single partner, or they are a single mother with a, a child. Uh, to ensure social stability, it is essential to invest in a new form of solidarity and collaboration between generation and the people. And so uh, I think we, for helping people in need, we need a new form of cooperative uh, from the public and private sector, for example. There is a, a question in the, in, the, in the chat about the role of uh, uh, community, of, uh, about uh, the, the civil society and elected people in the governance of city. Uh, it's very important. Uh, in, in Bergamo, it's very important the, the, the relationship with uh, civil society organization and uh, um, city governance. But, for example, in a uh, regional level, uh, I think we have not uh, learned the importance of the civil society. It's very important at local level, and we are learn the, the, the significance of the, the, the participation. And also, relation with religious group. Uh, there is a question about the role of religious group. For uh, Bergamo is very important. As you know, Bergamo is a region with a very strong relationship with the uh, uh, Catholic Church. And the role of the Catholic Church is very important, for example, to collect donation, to sustain uh, many, many of the service. Also, the COVID hotel, that we had made, we are uh, cooperating with uh, uh, Caritas Association, and so it's very, very uh, important the relationship and the supporting mutual to uh, make more trust and hope uh, in, in the people. I think it's very important uh, lesson that we are learning from this experience is. Uh, that uh, much of the solution lie uh, on uh, our ability to be responsible and support each other along with solidarity. I believe that pandemic can be fought if people act to, together. And uh, I, I think we need to, to, to rethink also the, the, the political organization because, uh, for, for example, in, uh, in, in Bergamo, or not in, in Italy, we often policy maker, maker only consider us when they serve to respond to emergency. But same politician and institution and national level, regional level, uh, prove unable to involve us in the long term planning. I, we need, uh, for a model of social economy based on local community, it's necessary for a sustainable and inclusive future. In the last year, inequality has increased due to the pandemic. And so we need a more inclusive economy and a more inclusive governance to make a, a model for a community that supports the people. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe, and this is exactly what Asher is doing uh, in, in Bristol. So thank you, and over yeah. to you, Asher. Yeah. Of course. I think I was going to say, for me, um, I think everyone thought the mayor was crazy <laughs> three, four years ago when we started to talk about the one city approach. Uh, and I have to take my hats off uh, uh, to Professor Hambleton because it's his vision that Marvin turned into reality. 
and it works for us in, in Bristol and I know it can work for you. You know, it's like what we have done is aligned a new fold and created a new form of city governance to sit alongside city government. And Marvin, our mayor will always say, I am not just mayor of the city council, I am mayor of the whole city. But the issue that we have, like you have in Europe, is that we don't have all of the levers. We cannot, you know, if we push, pull something here, we, we don't have control of it over here because uh, a lot of the power is centralised in local government. So one thing I am quite jealous about is how in, in Europe you seem to have a lot more power than we, we do as, as uh, city mayors other than the, the London mayor. So what I would say is really that, you know, um, adopting our one city approach um, has enabled us to coordinate an exceptional response to the COVID-19 crisis uh, because it, 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 we know that it impacts every single part of the city. And so our approach brings together public, private, voluntary, civic, faith organisations, education sector partners um, uh, and even communities having just completed a citizens so Asher we, we 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 cannot hear you now can you hear me now yes 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 oh sorry I don't know did, did I get switched off Probably, probably, but go, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Shall I start again on, on a... No, 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 we have just lost uh, probably the oh, 10 okay, seconds. Okay, just so, 10 seconds, um, yeah. I got to the part about, um, you know, all of the players in the city are very much a part of the one city approach. So everything from population health and well-being to the way in which our economy is going to be organised around our communities, considerations around the kind of future that the city our children are going to inherit. So we know that COVID-19 has highlighted, exacerbated the existing challenges, but it's also illuminated the interdependencies that between all of the all of the different players in the city. So time and time again, we know that as cities we've proven to be resilient. We can show we can build back collaboratively and creatively and improve the lives of our, of our citizens. So the kind of approach that we take promotes system change. And we have seen that in bucket loads during this year. We have been able to work, even our partners within the NHS, uh, within health, they would have taken maybe two, three years to make a policy a reality. We took weeks, two weeks, three weeks. We were making decisions and, and getting stuff done. And, um, you know, it was like a light bulb moment for everyone in the city to say, actually, it doesn't need to take us all of this long. But because of the, the systems and the red tape and everything that most of us are caught up in, um, you know, it takes forever to get a policy happening. When you're in a crisis, you haven't got time to sit down. You've just got to get it done. And guess what? It worked because we did it collaboratively. Even during COVID, we had so many different cells, everything from mental health, domestic violence, homelessness cell. And in every one of those cells, a representative from each of those um, organizations and representative groups were part of that. And we moved, the voluntary and community sector have moved from the from the margin completely into the mainstream because um, it we wouldn't have been able to um, go uh, recover in the way that we have done without their support. So we know that um, the situation though is it, uh, it remains really serious for us and we appreciate that there still is going to remain a lot of uncertainty and a difficult path ahead for all of us uh, but we know that when you navigate you've got to do it um, collective, have a collective vision and a collective commitment. And that is what we have from the city. You know, we just two weeks ago had a meeting of nearly 400 of our partners across the city. We do hold it twice a year and we were work, looking at the priorities for the city, how we build back better. And, um, you know, in all of our city boards and the themes that we have, um, there's some real kind of work, very focused work, digital inclusion. How are we going to um, increase new green jobs and introduce them into the economy? And those conversations are happening, happening right across the city. And 
Uh, but for me, what was really important was also how the communities, instead of it all just coming top down and us sitting in a room and having the conversation, we found a way using the citizen assembly approach uh, to get citizens to actually inform us about some of the uh, some amazing ideas that they came up with. So we now have um, a number of uh, actions. I think it's 82 actions across. Eight, 17 recommendations that came out of the citizens assembly and all of that is being built into is, is is being fed into our economic recovery plan so what we're saying it's the whole city that is going to be part of the recovery we can't do this on our own so everyone has a role to play uh, so uh, and it's just how we communicate that vision and ensure that we're bringing the city with us but um, we're not going to go back to the way how things were. We were a very vibrant, economically uh, well-to-do city in terms of our GDPR. I think outside of London, Bristol um, uh, contributes the highest amount to the GDPR. Obviously, that's not the case now. Uh, but we, we're a very, we're a young city. Uh, we are a very vibrant city. We've got a lot going for us. Um, uh, and so um, I, I, we feel really, really positive about the potential for the future. And again, we've also seen how, like even in local communities, how people have just pivoted really quickly and just, you know, um, just delivering their services in completely different ways. So even our funding, I've, I've set aside um, eight million pounds as recovery funding for the voluntary and community sector. And we are working with the sector right this minute to design the criteria for that following some research that we did. And I, I'm happy to share that with you uh, because that res research is delivering a new social reality for the voluntary community sector as part of Building Back Better. And um, we want to share that with you because it's going to be a real game changer for us, not only in Bristol, but I, I think we'd, uh, we'd like to share, we're going to share it across the country because uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the sector and the city cannot operate in the way that it did before. Thank you. Thank you, Asher. We, we very much look forward to, to reading that research. And I will tell you a little bit more on how we can go forward after this. So now over to Bruno and then Robin. There are a lot of questions to you and we want to hear from you. And please stay uh, with a lot of energy, but because we have also some interactive questions for all the people participating in the seminar. Bruno. Yeah, as, as has been already said, change is, is fast. We have to be prepared. We need to react. This was true in the past, is true during the pandemic. It, it will be true also, also in the future. And um, I'm quite sure that time is not uh, an, independent, an, an independent variable. Time is something that can change the way in which you, 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 you take a decision. Um, COVID is uh, accelerating some processes that already uh, were that already uh, were in place. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we think about the remote working that is tricky. Uh, this uh, was was true in the past is is uh, increasing now and opens new new way of thinking, new inequalities, new new way in which you have to deal and uh, and is shaping. Our landscape in a in a different way. Uh, there's uh, less need for offices. You 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 need bigger houses. Uh, you need uh, um, something for 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 the access. Not uh, not all have access to to this. There's uh, the importance of public spaces, parks, co-working spaces, gardens. And uh, you have to, to think about this when you, 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 you deal with the, the, the city that you have in mind and you, you, you are planning. Um, in Milan, we are thinking about uh, uh, 15 minutes way of living. All the service you need should be near to you uh, in a 15 minutes uh, in order to, to reach them. Uh, and if you, if you set this rule, you have to try to, <laughs> to make this happen. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, a, a really big uh, challenge. But uh, thinking about this, uh, you can think about living in the neighborhood and try to uh, restore, try to change uh, many 
uh, many areas that in the past were, were not so suitable for, for living. Um, you have to live in a distributed way, not just the center of the city. You have to, to deal the, with, uh, with this. And of course, uh, the, the increase the, uh, of, uh, of the environment awareness is something that we are dealing uh, we were dealing in the past, but the pandemic has accelerated also this. In Milan, uh, we thinking about the, the, the greener way of, of, of living. We, we are investing in the solar energy for the, and the, uh, for the, the transportation system. In five years, we will have no, no more gasoline fuel, just uh, green energy for, for all the public transportation. It's an investment of more than one billion, one billion of euros. It's something very huge, but it, it, it's happening and it will shape the, the city in a new, new way. And if we think about uh, uh, the, the opportunity of the remote working and a new way of dealing, we also have to deal with something that happened in the past, is happening now, that's the, the, increasing, um, the increasing problem of the house prices. So many students are, are being expelled from the city uh, younger and uh, a new way of thinking about the housing price uh, has to be take place when you imagine the city for for the future we are trying to 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 rule this particular sector um, try to distribute and try to uh, lower the gap between what uh, what is the the, the affordable uh, uh, solution for, for a person, the real solution. And half of the new residents that will be built from now to the Olympic Games that uh, will be held in Milan in uh, 2026 uh, will be under the market price of the houses, but really under, it's half the market price. And this can be done also because we are dealing with the private sector with cooperatives, it's uh, something that uh, Giuseppe knows very, very well. And this is some key for, for a, new, a new city that we, are, uh, that we are shaping, that we are thinking about. This is happening here, but it's happening, of course, uh, in, the, in the whole uh, uh, Europe and, uh, and, so, and so on. Um, at, at last, uh, uh, the role of technology. The technology is, is, not, uh, uh, is not good in itself, per se. It's something that has to be managed. Because uh, if you just approach technology for, for remote working, smart work, smart city, or, or the, the, the whole area that uh, this is uh, used, uh, it can uh, um, widen the, the inequalities. It's something that you have to, to deal with something that you have to to manage of course from from your role from from the, the things that you are thinking okay thank you thank Remember, you I'm thank quite you sure also for it's something that is uh, has been said uh, cities are a sustainable way of living this is very important because it's uh, if you think about the countryside the 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 the, the past it's uh, it's not so intelligible for a, for a for a person but i'm i'm very very fond of this it's it's true i think it's very very true and can be true also in the future so thank you bruno so now i will hand over to to robin a lot of questions for you from professor leslie bad uh, dame jane roberts great questions on um, you know how we can embed place-based leadership in UK constitutional settlements and more broadly globally uh, the importance of belonging to a place and the role of uh, place for political leadership and if you can mention a few examples of uh, um, cities leading uh, uh, on this respect and while you are speaking I'm also inviting the audience um, to go to the website and now I will give you the mic Robin to www.menti.com and type uh, 36 20 60 68. I'm going to type a message and you will find one question and I will ask you to uh, provide your answer. But uh, over to Robin now and I will share the screen to allow you to, to do this quick uh, participatory exercise. Robin, we are all here for you now. 
that's very good to have that participatory mechanism. Excellent. Well, firstly, can I just say uh, thank you to the excellent local leaders that we've heard from. It's inspiring. I've got four comments to make that I think cover 10 of the questions. Let's try. It's a bit ambitious. Firstly, I'd like to thank Matthew Jellings. He uh, very early on said, could we hear about some more inspiring examples to share? I think he said, try and find some, uh, identify some councils that are demonstrating the use of place-based power. Um, well, the first answer is to say, well, we've had four just now giving us their really helpful insights from their experience. But uh, in the book, I uh, highlight several cities in other countries, and I would just mention three quickly. Freiburg, Germany, Copenhagen in Denmark, and Portland, Oregon. So uh, what we have, these are very different countries with different constitutional arrangements, but in all those cases, you do have more power than in the UK at the local level, and that helps those cities to innovate. So I think someone was mentioning in Milan the uh, number of cars in the city in, uh, in recent years. Copenhagen now has more bikes than cars. It wasn't always like that in the 1970s. I can remember it. Copenhagen was just as car clogged as uh, many cities are today. But the local political leadership, and I think Jane Roberts hinted at the importance of that, I think all these stories do stem from wise political leadership pushing forward new ideas. And the good news is there's actually hundreds of good examples around the world. So thank you for that, Matthew. Uh, Rohini asked a question about smart cities. Um, is this a useful concept? Can this help us develop uh, the kinds of innovations we've been talking around today? I think my opinion on this might be changing a little bit. Um, I think I was very skeptical about technological solutions that often get captured by smart cities concepts. And I wrote a chapter in my last book arguing that we needed to move away from smart cities towards wise cities. In other words, it's not enough to gather loads of information about people's behavior and movements and so on. We need to have exercise of judgment about what to do. And that's where the wisdom comes in. And it's not just politicians who can bring that. It's obviously a range of leaders. But I do think smart cities uh, initiatives are improving and are getting more inclusive, certainly, than a few years ago. My third topic is collaborative governance. This, is, uh, this has been touched on by quite a few really good points and questions. I'm thinking of uh, John Diamond asking about civil society just filling gaps when there's a crisis. Can we be more collaborative more generally? I think Artuso Diana was talking about engaging civil society. And I think Dirk Brand talked about some experiences from Cape Town where they're doing that. And John Wolfe talked about religious groups, which are actually very important. We probably should have mentioned that a bit more so far. But basically, my argument would be the, there is a variety of ways of developing collaborative governance. And sparing Asher's blushes, I do think the model in Bristol is really quite pioneering because it brings those leaders together from those different realms of leadership into new spaces that then co-create new solutions. And there's not time now to outline, in fact, Asha's mentioned a few, but some very simple steps can be taken to break down boundaries. But the main thing is to create new spaces within which people can interact. So Marvin Rees is very keen to have lots of events and activities outside City Hall. Um, there's more to say, but I'm conscious of the time. I think the last point I wanted to touch on, again, it'll be very quick because of time, a new constitutional settlement. I think Leslie uh, Budd was talking about the importance of that. Uh, and I think John Paul Hayes was talking about how do we influence actors outside our place, the national and international actors. And I think this is critical to the success of places that local leaders lead beyond place as well as within place. Easy to do, or oh, sorry, easy to say, not so easy to do, but it means actively campaigning to influence national levels of government, but also international. And the growth of city diplomacy in the last decade is really quite significant in global politics. 
getting a voice at the UN is something that's starting to happen. It's, it's gentle steps, but unless we alter those power relations that cities and localities are embedded within, we will struggle. I suppose last point to make on that, and it just come back to what Jane was saying, I think political leaders are best place to campaign and lead on these agendas, but with their co collaborators in the other realms of leadership, it comes back to the civic leadership of place, not just the political leadership of place. I think I just want to make one last comment, uh, Alessandro, about Build Back Better. I found uh, Sir Michael Marmot's ideas very helpful. He's been researching and studying inequality in Britain for well, more than a decade. And he's argued only early this year that we need to build back fairer. In other words, build back better isn't enough. You have to address the inequality agenda as you develop your new policies. I'm sorry if I've missed good points out from colleagues. I'm sure I have, but uh, I really appreciate all the comments that have come in. So back to you, Alessandro. Thank you, Robin. And I don't know if you can see uh, my screen where, where there are the results of this short survey. Could you see those? Yes, I can see. Yes, so you can see I'm starting from the second question because it is easier. So what is, in your view, the key driver for leading cities to post-COVID-19 recovery? And uh, we can see social innovation uh, is uh, um, on the top of your answers. Uh, local governance and cross-local solidarity. I'm quite pleased about cross-local solidarity. As Bruno was saying, technology opens up also uh, the possibility to realize new institutions. Uh, we are potentially a new movement connecting people again from South Africa, San Francisco, South America, China, Milan, London, Bristol, Bergamo, and, uh, and many other places. So this seems to, to bring into the idea of quite a collective view of, of place-based leadership. But I don't want to speak uh, myself. I, I would like to leave the floor to our uh, wonderful speakers and please uh, uh, keep in uh, sending uh, questions. We still have 13 minutes uh, and I want to ask you all and thank you also for uh, sharing uh, important resources on the chat box. So please uh, have a look. But uh, now I will ask you a, a very quick uh, uh, question. So two short round of the table. So first, a, a, a 60 second uh, message from the four cities. So, Georgia, Giuseppe, Asher, and Bruno. Uh, one message from London, Bergamo, Milan, and Bristol. So, let's start from, from London. Georgia, 60 seconds. One message from London to the world. Message from London to the world. I mean, I think the, my message from London would would be that we are a, a city of huge, where a huge amount of wealth is created um, for, for the rest of the UK and a global city, but we are a place also of deep inequalities where um, too many children grow up in poverty. And so as as we move forward, our I think our mission as a city has to be to address those those long term inequalities. And as we as we grow, um, to transform um, to transform uh, the 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 inequalities in our city. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, Giuseppe, then Asher and Bruno. Giuseppe, 60 seconds from Bergamo. Oh, okay, from Bergamo. I, I think we need a, a very a social innovation to propose uh, three levels of innovation. Uh, digital translation, sustainability and uh, ecological translation without social dimension and inclusion for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Escher. Okay, so for us here in Bristol, COVID really has, has demonstrated um, the limitations of the response that has sucked up the sovereignty into central government and leaves those of us who are closest to communities really grappling with the uncertainty. So uh, for us in Bristol, we it's, it's a message we've been saying. We need more devolution of sovereignty, of powers and of funding, not just to us as local authorities, but we want to get that resource right down to local communities, which allows us to really like build partnerships and connect with those who have always been left behind. Bruno? Well, uh, we are willing to to think about this uh, 
uh, COVID experience as the past, but we should be better than uh, we were in the past. This is a commitment for for us all. And uh, at last, uh, in Milan we miss uh, tourists. So uh, as long as uh, you can just come and visit because we of course are, are missing many, many, many people. Yeah, so thank you. We still have a few minutes uh, and uh, I want to ask you now a very quick questions and please uh, feel free to use the chat box also to provide uh, um, ideas. Uh, so before doing this final round, let, let me say a, a huge uh, thank you to uh, those who have helped to make uh, this webinar happening. So Michelle, Joanna, Kit, and all the people at uh, uh, the Open University, all the students from four uh, universities, uh, Bristol, oh. the Open University, Bergamo, uh, Milano Bicocca, also people, uh, students from Switzerland. And so thank you. But one person uh, asked me, uh, one uh, um, challenging question. So, uh, why uh, are you all? We are, are we doing this? And um, this is a challenging question because it goes back to the idea of using technology not just as impression management. So, when we use social networks, uh, we are all, you know, very much followers of uh, getting likes uh, or, or, or other things. So, let's use this. Uh, nine uh, remaining minutes um, to try to do one final exercise. That is, how can we work together uh, as a community? So we have four great uh, local leaders, some many uh, very important professors, uh, citizens, students. Uh, we are a, a community of ideas, of energies, a transnational community. So how we can continue to work together uh, after this. So let's have this um, final um, brainstorming uh, exercise in terms of uh, uh, key actions and I will take the responsibility for keeping alive this community of people. I think, and uh, um, this is my last point before uh, opening up the floor and please do fill in the chat box for those uh, listening because you are also the leaders uh, so we are all creating leadership, not just the, the, the speakers, but we need to do that, that for the memory of the civic leaders who have lost uh, life against the fight uh, to COVID-19. We have uh, had a lot of people uh, going out, uh, you know, and uh, giving their lives to, to save other lives. So this is a, a wonderful lesson and that we are all inter interdependent, uh, embracing a relational um, existence. So, uh, how we can continue to work together from Bergamo, Bristol, London, Milan, and all together? What could we do? Again, the final round of table. And of course, there will be the recordings of this event that will be widely shared. Can I just kick off? I think what, what um, one of the things I've really appreciated over the last year, particularly in the fact that none of us can actually travel anywhere, is that via the use of this technology, it has allowed us to connect with so many different leaders and so many different cities from all over the world. And the one thing about me is that I really like to look at um, good practice and many of the many of the initiatives and many things that we do in Bristol. Um, I, I've taken those ideas from like Seattle in Washington, you know, in. Uh, in Australia, you know, and kind of applied it to uh, to Bristol. So I, I'd like us to maybe think about continuing to um, have sessions like these on specific topics because we are all facing the same challenges. And what better way than to sit down with each other or Zoom each other and have a conversation and, and uh, address those issues together. Thank you, Asher. Whoever wants to go for first. Uh, yeah. Giuseppe, Giuseppe. Yeah. I, I try again. But I, I think we, we need to invest uh, more time and uh, resources to educate uh, young generation. Uh, many of the politics uh, talk about uh, in uh, a lot of rhetoric around the Green Deal when adults and political decision makers say young people will shape the world. I think we need uh, 
Instead, that is time to uh, make an intergenerational responsibility at all level. Uh, we need to involve more young for uh, innovate in the uh, town, in the governance. We, we, we talk about, uh, a lot about uh, the, the, the young, but we don't uh, talk uh, and out with, together, the young for uh, uh, a new vision, for the made uh, a new form of governance in the whole city. Uh, we need to invest a lot of education and solidarity, participation model, a new form of economy, because we are uh, push a lot of uh, um, mainstream economy. Now we, we need to grow, to grow, to grow, and uh, the, the, the entrepreneur is a uh, uh, people that uh, think uh, alone. And now we need the new form of think, the think together for the future. This is my opinion. To make Thank you, Giuseppe. New community. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, Giorgia, or Bruno, Bruno and then Giorgia, yeah. Well, okay, okay. It's, I'm quite sure that this meeting is what we should do. Uh, you're doing very fine uh, in uh, organizing this and try to exchange also because we are facing the same issue, same problem. Maybe managing it uh, in uh, managing them in a different way, but exchanging and sharing our our uh, our experience is something very good. So uh, we must keep in touch. Uh, from from our side is of course uh, it's it's an okay, it's uh, an enthusiastic okay, of course, and. Uh, the struggle is uh, for us all. We we should be together, think together, and try to face uh, the, the the challenge we have together. That's true in in our city. That's true in in the whole Europe, in the whole world. Thank you, Bruna, Georgia, and Robin. Yes, can I make one? I know you're we're right up against the time now. I think, but just one comment that struck me as uh, as you've been talking. Maybe universities could be doing even more to help deal with some of these challenges. I know we've got colleagues from different universities in this discussion. i just make two quick points. One is I think we've seen a welcome rise in civic engagement by universities in the places where they're located. So somewhere like the Politecnico di Milano is very involved in helping the govern the city in different ways, including city planning and so on. That's happening in a lot of uh, cities around the world now. Um, and I think uh, here in Bristol, we have both two universities very actively involved in the one city approach that Asha outlined. But I want to push it a bit further. Could the universities be doing more to help with this international learning? Scholars hopefully are quite good at analyzing information together, revealing insights. Could they be working more actively with their cities on the international collaborative efforts that those cities are undertaking? There are good networks of cities, but I do think sometimes we miss opportunities <coughs> because there isn't academic support to help draw out the lessons from the shared experience. So maybe there's more to do with that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I, I entirely agree with you and Georgia. For you, the, the, the last round of closing from London, the, the, the most powerful, uh, one of the most powerful cities in the world. So hopefully you can be at the forefront of this community of uh, civic leaders. Uh, we, all, we, we all are and we all could be. So thank you also to Dirk, John Wolf, many comments that we'll take into consideration. Well, it's a challenge we have in London. So we have 33 different boroughs of which Camden is one and you said I was chair of London councils and and we also have the mayor of London so our big challenge throughout a crisis is how to create shared governance across London and so we've had to to do the work really quickly on how we kind of how we work deeply together scale up best practice very quickly and had to create kind of new institutions to do that I think being online has really helped and I think that some of the, that kind of that governance that we've created, we should be using that better to then connect in with other places. I absolutely agree with everything that's been said about the, the role of universities. And in Camden, we have about eight universities and we've got um, quite active public collaboration labs where academics work with us to solve 
challenges and I think that you know it, we could have a really exciting exchange and, and, and dialogue mm-hmm. about those issues. I, I think the, the, the thing I'd say just from a completely selfish personal point of view is as a, a, a leader of a place I would love um, a forum where I were to come to, together with, with leaders um, in a similar position taking specific challenges and all of us sharing um, our different ideas and challenges because you know leading a leading a place during a crisis can feel like a, a lonely job you're you're kind of managing so many different kind of areas so a kind of private space to really talk through deeply those kind of different challenges and learning would be something that I I know that I and, and my colleagues uh, would welcome so if if that's something you guys could convene then I think that would be a, a brilliant contribution to, to the discussion and I think we always we always it's always so helpful to um, to see different different places and how they do things. And I think any any good local leader is a bit of a magpie picking up ideas from different places, testing them in your place. And I think the the, the beauty of, of local government is sometimes it's messiness, that there is room for experimentation, that some things really don't work uh, and you can stop doing them, but you can scale up things that do. And, and um, it's a it's a new and different model of of doing things and it requires almost the green shoots that are happening around the world to connect together to become a forest to go through the analogy that that really transforms things so thank you georgia and thank you all Uh, uh, it has been a wonderful uh, uh, one hour and a half it's exactly 5 30 pm and i hope uh, this is the first brick of uh, you know a digital village of uh, civic leaders We all could be civic leaders and go out and try to improve uh, uh, our places. So from our side, we will be working to keep this community uh, Mm -hmm. together. So thank you for joining us and uh, hopefully more soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you.